reading is from Isaiah 38, which can be found on page 722 of the Church Bibles. Isaiah 38. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stair of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps it had gone down. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I said, in the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? I said, I will not again see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the, li of the living. No longer will I look on mankind or be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life, and he has cut me off from the loom. Day and night, you made an end of me. I waited patiently till dawn, but like a lion, he broke all my bones. Day and night, you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or thrush. I moaned like a morning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I am troubled, O oh Lord, come to my aid. But what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things men live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love you kept me from the pit of destruction, you have put all my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot praise you, death cannot sing your praise, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they praise you, as I am doing today. Fathers, tell their children about your faithfulness. The Lord will save me and will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Isaiah had said, Pre prepare a poultice of figs and apply it to the boil and he will recover Hezekiah had asked what will be the sign that I will go up to the temple of the Lord this is the word of the Lord thank you for reading let's pray before we start Lord we are weak and we need your help. Please grant us understanding and grant that we will be changed by your word. Amen. Learning to drive is always a big milestone in life. And nowadays we don't just have to take the practical test, but also the theory test. The idea behind doing the theory, of course, is to make sure everyone understands the warnings and the dangers. But after you've completed a theory test, you're not handed your driving license. Not yet. Because understanding the warnings is vital, but what really matters is what happens when the rubber hits the road. And so it's been with our time in Isaiah so far. We've heard from God, warning after warning, not to trust in human solutions but to trust in God alone. He is the only sure foundation. If you remember, the big superpower looming over Judah at this time is Assyria. 
to looking to stretch their empire to include Judah. That is the danger. But as we saw last week, Assyria is no, just, no longer just a theoretical threat. Now it's real. It's happening. They're at the door. And so last week, if you were here, we saw Sennacherib's invasion. And that was the first of two test cases. Cases for the king of Judah, King Hezekiah. Now the time for trusting God is here. The question is, how will the king and his people get on? Will they trust in God alone for their deliverance? And that's much like normal life, isn't it? We pray for our trust to be strengthened, and we don't have to really wait very long to put it into practice. We pray for patience, and five minutes later, that's exactly what's needed. We pray for humility, and the day is full of opportunities, opportunities to keep depending on God for what we need. So we need the warnings. We need to see the danger of putting our trust in other things because they don't work. And we need to the promises, the wonderful assurance we've seen of blessings to come and hope that spurs us on. So how has Hezekiah fared so far? Well, so far, so good. The Assyrians did invade Jerusalem, the capital. Hezekiah did seek the Lord's deliverance. And of course, God did enact a remarkable turnaround. The whole invading army wiped out without even a sword being drawn. But what Isaiah records for us next is a more personal account of Hezekiah in a personal crisis. Unusually, the events of chapters 38 and 39 almost certainly happened before 36 and 7, the Assyrian invasion. We can see that, chapter 38, verse 6. God promises to deliver the city from Assyria, which, of course, we know has already happened. So we'll be asking, why has Isaiah, the author, put things this way around? But first, what's happening? So my headings today are outlining the story for us, to help us follow along, looking first at God's promises of deliverance, up to verse 8. Hezekiah is not well. He's facing death. And Isaiah, as God's prophet, comes and confirms Hezekiah's fears. Let's see that, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. What can Hezekiah say to that? Well, Hezekiah knows his God. He knows he is a God of mercy and grace. So, verse 2, he turns and prays to God. And through Hezekiah's tears, the Lord hears his prayers. God sends Isaiah back and says, verse 5, Go and tell Hezekiah, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. Absolutely remarkable. What a gracious God to hear and answer his prayer. I suspect there are many of us here this morning or maybe watching at home who would be delighted with a guaranteed 15 years of health. Well, it's important to see what God points to when making this promise to the king. Verse 5, the Lord is the God of your father, David. You may remember from your big picture overviews in home groups that God made a promise to King David generations before that he would establish David's throne, his royal line, forever. And if you do the maths with other records in the Bible, as some have, it's likely that Hezekiah didn't have any children at this point. So these extra 15 years are the opportunity for the promise to David to continue. And of course, it's that promise that leads to the true king. It's through him that all his followers 
have not just 15 years of perfect health, but when with our king for eternity. So God is very gracious to Hezekiah, but he goes even further. As we saw, Hezekiah gets a double promise, the deliverance of his life and the city. Verse 6, God says, And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. Hezekiah receives more than he asked for. And if that wasn't enough, the Lord even offers a sign to confirm the double promise. God is ensuring that Hezekiah is fully equipped for the life of faith. And as we know, he's soon to put that into practice when Sennacherib comes knocking. And I think we know something of this in our own lives. Of course, not every prayer is answered exactly as we want it. But we know that God does hear and does answer our prayers. He sees our tears and he's been very gracious with us. I don't know about you, but I'm so quick to forget that. I often pray for something like, a trouble-free school run, or a good doctor's appointment, or help with a relationship problem. And I get what I asked for, and I think, oh, it probably would have just happened anyway. How quick we are to forget the deliverances and the mercies that were given every day. And God doesn't want that for Hezekiah. He doesn't want him to forget. So what's this sign? Verse 8 God says, I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps it had gone down. Of course, the mind boggles how something like this would be possible, but of course the effect of the sign is in the fact that it, it isn't possible. Only the God of the universe could do something so amazing. And it seems these steps, perhaps near the temple or the king's palace, acted like some sort of sundial. And so just as Hezekiah has had the clock turned back and time added to his life, so the same happens here with the sunlight on the steps. But whose name is also mentioned here? Did you see it? Verse 8. It's the stairway of Ahaz. Ahaz was Hezekiah's dad. And earlier on in Isaiah's life, Ahaz was also facing an invading army. And you can read it in chapter 7, back then, through Isaiah, God offered Ahaz promises of deliverance and even a sign to confirm it. But unfortunately, Ahaz wasn't interested in either. When it came to trusting God when it really mattered, he failed the test. So again, the question raised here is, Is Hezekiah going to do any better? Is he going to trust God when it matters? And so far, we have to say, yes. In this personal crisis, Hezekiah has turned to the only one who can help him. And God has graciously heard his prayers and given the king an amazing double promise of deliverance. A promise of deliverance personally and deliverance for the whole city. And of course, we're not the king, but we too, as we've seen in Isaiah, have been given enormous promises, promises of ultimate deliverance from God's judgment, kept safe on that terrible day. And though we pray with tears now, we have the promise that weeping will cease. No one will say, I am ill, and we'll only rejoice because our eyes will see the king. Like Hezekiah, our promises are also confirmed in the mercies we see every day and in the sign that our King Jesus is alive, risen from the dead. God has made sure that we have everything we need for trusting him each day. So how will Hezekiah respond to the promises he's been given? Well, from verse 9, we get something like a psalm to God from Hezekiah, describing his deliverance from death to life, and my second point, his pledge of faithfulness. We haven't got time to to look at all of this, 
But let's just see something of how he describes his situation. Verse 12. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. My whole life, I think I've only slept in a tent on about two occasions, both of which mean I'm not keen to make it three. (laughs) And here, Hezekiah realized that his life is as fragile and as permanent as a tent, and a nomadic shepherd's tent at that, here one day and packed up the next. Verse 13, he says, I waited patiently till dawn, but like a lion, he broke all my bones. Day and night, you made an end of me. Hezekiah sees God has brought him to the end of himself. There is nothing he can do to save himself. Verse 14, I cried like a swift or a thrush. I moaned like a mourning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. The king here is like a a chirping bird that never ceases, always looking to heaven, continually seeking God's deliverance, a place of utter dependence. But, as one commentator put it, the lion heard the mourning of the dove. The Lord graciously heard and answered the king's prayer. So how does Hezekiah respond? Verse 17. Surely it was for my good that I suffered such anguish. How can he say that? How can there be any good in so much suffering? Well, twice Hezekiah says to God, you made an end of me. Hezekiah was brought to a place where he could see clearly his need for God. Maybe, like me on a Sunday, your thoughts go to the week ahead. And it's a revealing question to ask yourself, what am I relying on for the week ahead? What am I really trusting in to get me through to to next Sunday? For me, if I'm honest, too often I'm relying and trusting in the money and resources I have, the time I have, my to-do list and the abilities I have to complete it, my routine, some good medication and subsequent health, I think all those things will just carry on as usual and I have the ability to make sure that they do. Maybe you're the same. But when a crisis comes along, in family or health or work, then we're shaken out of our self-reliance and thrown as we should be onto the mercies of God. Only then do we see clearly the place of utter dependence on God that we're really in every day. But being brought to the end of ourselves is horrible. It's not at all pleasant. But spiritually, as Hezekiah realizes, it's a good place to be. And so in this spiritual high, Hezekiah resolves. He makes pledges to be faithful to God. Let's see that, verse 15. I will walk humbly all my years. Verse 19. The living, the living, they praise you, as I am doing today. Fathers, tell their children about your faithfulness. Hezekiah is pledging to walk humbly before God for his remaining 15 years. He's pledging praise to God and to teach his children of God's faithfulness. What's what's more, verse 20, he says, the Lord will save me. Perhaps remembering the promise for the city as well. He goes on, and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Hezekiah's definition of life is enjoying the presence of God. That's real life. And maybe you can identify with Hezekiah's high point here. Maybe after a particular deliverance or when returning from a summer camp or a conference and tasting afresh the goodness of God. Or any time we've simply delighted to be in God's presence. Of course, like Hezekiah, we then resolve to live in the light of what we've heard or experienced. And Hezekiah does the same. Again, he's fully equipped to stay on track, trusting God. He's received the first of two promises. And so the king has every reason 
to trust in God alone to save the city from the Assyrians. Chapter 39, verse 1. At that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of his illness and recovery. Remember, all the people in Isaiah are real people from real history. So we know from history a little bit about King Baladan. This is the map we've been using. I've always wanted to use this pointer. Here we go. Um, so here is Judah over here. All this green is the Assyrian Empire. Over here is Babylon. And at this time, Babylon are a pain in the Assyrian neck. In fact, under King Baladan, they've been shaking off Assyrian rule and continue to fight for their freedom. So when King Baladan hears about Judah also having Assyria trouble, what a great opportunity to send his son and the diplomatic party to woo King Hezekiah into an alliance. But with his recent recovery as well, what a great opportunity to send, verse 1, gifts and letters. But of course, we know what Hezekiah has just been through. He's seen the Lord's deliverance firsthand. He's had his health restored, a promise to keep the city safe, and even the clock turned back to prove it. Hezekiah won't listen to these Babylonians, will he? Well, my last point looks at Hezekiah's misplaced faith in the well. Chapter 39, verse 2. Hezekiah received the envoys gladly and showed them what was in his storehouses. The silver, the gold, the spices, the fine oil, his entire armory and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. We don't know exactly what was written in those letters, but we can see the reaction it provoked. Here comes Babylon wondering if Judah might be a good ally. And instead of the, just giving them some tea and biscuits and sending them on their way, Hezekiah is keen to convince them he's their man. So he shows them all his resources and military might. What a disappointment. What about the 15 years of life? What about the sign? What about the pledge of faith? What was Hezekiah thinking? Well, we know something of what he was thinking. Verse 3, Isaiah comes and asks, where are these men from? Hezekiah replies, from a distant land. They came to me from Babylon all that way to see special me. So from a spiritual high and seemingly unshakable trust in God, all it took was a bit of flattery and Hezekiah is back to square one, back to trusting in foreign alliances, which was the problem to start with in Isaiah. And isn't that just the way the world works? I had this through my door the other day. It says, you deserve better boiler cover. It's, it's not only offering me better boiler cover, but it's flattering me into buying it because I'm so important. I actually don't have any boiler cover. Maybe I should. But as soon as the world says, you deserve it, because you're worth it, be the best you can be. If we're listening to that message, then our eyes are taken off God and we're back to self-dependence and self-importance. And it seems Hezekiah has fallen for the same trick. So what does God have to say? Through Isaiah, verse 5, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up to this day will be carried off to Babylon. The punishment fits the crime. Hezekiah wants to show everything to Babylon and so Babylon will get the lot. What is prophesied here is exile. Though not in Hezekiah's lifetime, Babylon will eventually be overthrown, well, sorry, will eventually overthrow Assyria. And this is like the big reveal in Isaiah. 
the big threat, the big baddie, is no longer Assyria, but Babylon. And from this point on, though generations away, the book of Isaiah will only look beyond exile. God says to Hezekiah, verse 7, And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Eunuchs in the king's family is not good news for carrying on that royal line. What will happen to the promise made to David, his throne established forever? And Hezekiah's response to this judgment is surprisingly sad. Verse 8, The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, there'd be peace and security in my lifetime. He couldn't make it up. The last time God declared an end for Hezekiah, he threw himself on God's mercy. Now it's just apathy and smug self-importance. Are we being too harsh on Hezekiah? Don't we make the same mistakes? Well, yes, as we said, we are too quick to forget God's promises and forget how dependent we are. Like Hezekiah, we're great at turning to God in emergencies, but when things are going okay, throw in a bit of self-importance, and we've forgotten the lessons we learnt. People may have said to you, I wish I had your faith. But the problem here is not a lack of faith, it's what or who that faith is in. Or you may have heard the question, which wheel is God in your car? Your steering wheel or just your spare tyre? Are we depending on God for everything as we travel through life? Or is he just a backup if our plans fail? It's all too true. But the problem here in Judah is not so much that we the people are like the king. It's that the king is just like everyone else. That's why Isaiah placed events this way round. Hezekiah, like us, gets it right sometimes. But as God's king, he needs the perfect score in the test of faith. But he fails. And the people will only follow their king. Exile is on the horizon. So what hope is there? Well, let's just look down at the first few words of verse 40. Sorry, of chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people. How can God say that? Well, we're going to pause on Isaiah after today and pick up from chapter 40 next term. And we'll see that the only hope for God's people beyond exile is in God sending the 100% faithful king. The king who never fails. The king who never has an off day or off moment. The king who is faithful even surrendering to death to bring us eternal life. In Jesus, we trust in the perfectly faithful king. Our test score will always be too low. It will never cut it. But through Jesus, our lack of consistent faith is forgiven. How good that is to know. And so let's not let past failures mean we shy away from making a fresh pledge of faith. Through Jesus, we can come again, or maybe for the first time, in utter dependence. We have all we need to trust him for our ultimate deliverance from death and enjoying life in his presence. We trust in him for the grace we need every day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your perfect King Jesus. We thank you that even though we fail, your son is perfectly faithful and has achieved for us the deliverance we could never achieve. Please help us to keep trusting in you alone every day. Amen.